it is a maxim of current economic orthodoxy that governments compete with the private sector on a limited pool of savings. It is considered equally, equally self-evident that the private sector is better, more competent, and more efficient at allocating scarce economic resources and thus at preventing waste. It is therefore thought economically sound to reduce the size of government, in other words, to minimize its tax intake and its public borrowing, in order to free resources for the private sector to allocate them more productively and more efficiently. Yet both, both dogmas are far from being universally applicable or even proven. The assumption underlying the first conjecture is that government obligations and corporate lending are perfect substitutes. In other words, once deprived of treasury notes, bills and bonds, a rational investor is expected to divert her savings to buying stocks or corporate bonds. <laughs> it is further anticipated that financial intermediaries such as pension funds, banks, mutual funds will tread similarly. If they were rendered unable to invest the savings of their depositors in scarce, risk-free, in other words, government securities, they will likely alter their investment preferences and they will start buying equity and debt issued by firms. This is expressly untrue. Bond buyers and stock investors are two distinct crowds. Their risk aversion is different. Their investment preferences are disparate. The profiles have nothing to do with each other. Some of them, for example, pension funds, are constrained by law as to the composition of their investment portfolios. Once government debt has turned scarce or expensive, bond investors tend to resort to cash. That cash, not equity, not corporate debt, that cash is the veritable substitute for risk-free securities. That is the basic tenet of modern investment portfolio theory. Moreover, the perfect substitute hypothesis assumes the existence of efficient markets and frictionless transmission mechanisms. But this is a conveniently idealized picture, which has little to do with grubby reality. Switching from one kind of investment to another kind of investment incurs often prohibitive transaction costs. In many countries, financial intermediaries are dysfunctional or corrupt or both. <laughs> They're unable to efficiently convert savings to investments or wary of doing so. Furthermore, very few capital and financial markets are closed, self-contained, self-sufficient units. Governments can and do borrow from foreigners. Most rich world countries, with the exception of Japan, tap foreign people's money for their public borrowing needs. When the United States government borrows more, it crowds out the private sector in Japan or China, not in the United States. It is universally agreed that governments have at least two critical economic roles. The first one is to provide a level playing field for all economic players. It is supposed to foster competition, enforce the rule of law, and in particular, property rights, encourage free trade, avoid distorting fiscal incentives and disincentives, and so on and so forth. The second role of governments is to cope with market failures and the provision of public goods. It is expected to step in, the government is expected to step in when markets fail to deliver goods and services, when asset bubbles inflate or when economic resources are blatantly misallocated. And yet there is a third role, actually. In our post-Keynesian world, this third role is a heresy. It flies in the face of the Washington Consensus propagated by the Bretton Woods institutions and the development banks the world over. It is the government's obligation to foster growth. In most countries of the world, definitely in Africa, the Middle East, the bulk of Latin America, Central and Eastern Europe, Central and East Asia, savings do not translate to investments, either in the form of corporate debt or in the form of corporate equity. 
in most countries of the world, institutions do not function. The rule of law and property rights are not upheld. The banking system is dysfunctional and clogged by bad debts. Rusty monetary transmission mechanisms render monetary policy impotent. In most countries of the world, there is no entrepreneurial and thriving private sector. The economy is at the mercy of external shocks and fickle bubbles business cycles. Only the state can counter these economically detrimental vicissitudes. Often the sole engine of growth and the exclusive automatic stabilizer is public spending. Not all types of public expenditures have the desired effect, admittedly. Witness Japan's pork barrel spending on infrastructure projects. But development related and consumption enhancing spending is usually beneficial. Ask Franklin Delano Roosevelt when you get there. <laughs> to say in most countries of the world that public borrowing is crowding out the private sector is nonsense. It's wrong. It assumes the existence of a formal private sector, which can tap the credit and capital markets through functioning financial intermediaries, notably banks and stock exchanges. And yet this mental picture is a figment of economic imagination. The bulk of the private sector in these countries is informal. To many of them, there are no credit or capital markets to speak of in many of them. The government doesn't borrow from savers through the marketplace, but internationally, often from multilaterals. Outlandish default rates result in vertiginously high interest rates. Intercorporate lending, barter and cash transactions substitute for bank credit, corporate bonds or equity flotations. As a result, the private sector's financial leverage is minuscule. In the rich West, one dollar in equity generates three to five dollars in debt for a total investment of four to six dollars. In the developing world, a one dollar of tax evaded equity generates nothing. The state has to pick up the slack. Growth and employment are public goods. Developing countries are in a perpetual state of systemic and multiple market failures. Rather than lend to businesses and households, banks thrive on leverage and arbitrage. Investment horizons are limited. Should the state refrain from stepping in to fill up the gap? Well, if governments were to abstain, walk away, avoid, these countries are doomed to inexorable decline. In times of global crisis, these observations pertain to rich and developed countries as well. Market failures signify corruption and inefficiency in the private sector. Such misconduct and misallocation of economic resources is usually thought to be the domain of the public sector, but actually it goes on everywhere in the economy. Wealth destruction. The destruction of wealth by privately owned firms is typical of economies without, with absent, lenient or lax regulation and often exceeds anything the public administration does. Corruption driven by avarice and fear is common among entrepreneurs as much as it is among civil servants. It is a myth to believe otherwise. Wherever there is money, human psychology is in operation, and with human psychology, economic malaise. Hence the need for governmental micromanagement of the, pub of the private sector at all times. Self-regulation is a costly and self-deceiving urban legend. Another engine of state invol involvement is provided by the thrift paradox. When the economy goes sour, Rational individuals and households save more and spend less. The aggregate outcome of their newfound thrift is recessionary. Decreasing consumption translates into declining corporate profitability and rising unemployment. And these effects are especially pronounced when financial transmission mechanisms, banks, other financial institutions, when they are gummed up, frozen in fear and distrust, they don't lend money. They don't lend money out even though deposits and their own capital base are ever growing and more than adequate. It is true that by diversifying risk away via the use of derivatives and other financial instruments, asset markets no longer affect the real economy as they used to. They have become, in a sense, 
gated communities separated from Main Street by risk barriers. But these developments do not pertain to retail banks and as we have recently witnessed. And when markets are illiquid and counterparty risk is rampant, options and swaps are pretty useless. The only way to effectively cancel out this demonetization of the national economy, this bleeding, is through enhanced government spending. Where fearful citizens save, their government should spend on everything, infrastructure, health, education, information technology, you name it. The state's negative savings should offset multiplying private savings. In extremis, the state should nationalize the financial sector for a limited period of time, as Israel has done in 1983 and Sweden a decade later. The government has a pivotal role in maintaining the economy and in fostering growth. And don't let, don't let anyone else tell you differently. Definitely not the private sector, which has been busy destroying wealth through the financial arms and financial transmission mechanisms.